Well, today I want to talk about three of my favorite spring blooming shrubs. Now, there are so many different spring bloomers and I have grown a lot of them. And over time, I have found that some of them perform better than others. These are the stellar performers in my garden. And if you want to go back and watch previous videos, Stuart will add some stills of what they look like when they're in bloom. But if you want to go back and see what they look like when everything is voluptuous and gorgeous and in bloom, then by all means do so. Now I bring this up now and I want to point this out now because even though they're not in bloom and you can't see them in all of their glory, nevertheless pretty soon if not already these are the the flowering shrubs that you're going to be able to find in your nursery and garden centers now. Later on when it's not spring anymore you may not find them so readily available unless you work through a landscaper or you go to a specialty nursery nursery. But right now, most of your nurseries will carry these, and so I want you to be, really be opportunistic and take advantage of this window of time when they might be. Now, this one is one of my favorite. It is Dutzia, or some people pronounce it Deutzia. If any of you pronounce it differently, please let me know. This is what I think of as a very, very romantic, white blooming, very delicate shrub. You can see here it's gotten up to about four feet tall. It's gotten even taller than this, but I contain it by whacking it back. That's the official term. I whack it back after it blooms, which is typically probably late April, and I will cut it back by as much as two-thirds. Last year, I think I cut it back by about a third, and that wasn't quite enough. Now, Stuart, if you don't mind, just if, as you have backed away, I'm going to bring you closer because I want you to, to, I want to show people that you can see that it is starting to leaf out. Can you see that, Stuart? Yeah. the new growth on there. Now it puts out kind of a, a, a long strappy, what they would call like a slender doitzia um, leaf and it will leaf out and that's pretty but then it puts the most delicate, puts on the most delicate little buds and tiny little flowers. Some people mistaken it for spirea, but I find that its growth habit isn't nearly as weedy as that. I have also seen some pale pink varieties that are relatively new and some more compact varieties, but this is probably just one of the more common ones. I got this many, many years ago, I think at Home Depot. Now, for full disclosures, at one time I had it towards the back and it probably there used to be a redbud tree back there and it really was getting a bit too much shade so what i have found in terms of where it wants to be positioned is it seems to be happiest on the brink of shade so it does get quite a bit of light but a little bit of shade protection later in the afternoon now this is three one two three and it made a huge mass when I moved it from where it was unhappy to where it was happy. And that is part of my, my gardening strategy. I will move something three times until it's happy. And after that, if it still is a complainer and grouchy, then I just probably move it to somebody else's garden or to the compost pile. But this one turned out to be absolutely breathtaking. Now, I like to plant it because it's at a time of year when pretty much everything in my garden is in pale hues. There will still be some daffodils in bloom, there'll be muscari, there'll be some hyacinths, um, and everything is largely in pale yellow, blue, and white, especially if I do what I so often do, and that is grow it with other white blooming companions that bloom at the same time. So I might use, uh, plant some white tulips near it. 
I have some white blooming uh, Dicentra spectabilis or bleeding heart in the background. There's some Solomon seal that comes up, variegated Solomon seal that is white and green. And then you've got these really little delicate pinpoints of white buds with delicate dainty little flowers. And to me, that's when it's, it's prettiest, when it's both in bud and in flower. And it lasts for a pretty long time. I would say, weather permitting, it will last for three weeks, but it looks far beautiful for longer than that as it's coming into bud. Now, after it blooms, it's not such a much. I mean, it's just going to be, it's kind of like forsythia. It's just going to be um, a good fixture in the summer landscape, but it's not gonna do a whole lot. But by the same token, it doesn't detract from the landscape. It just looks green and it's a nice backdrop for other bloomers. So all after it blooms, spring bloomers prune after bloom, I will prune this down by probably two thirds this year so that next year it will bloom a little bit shorter. Another reason that I do that, pruning it after it blooms, is because there are things surrounding it that I want to showcase. So in the foreground and to the north of it, I have some white wedding hydrangeas, I have some oak leaf hydrangeas in the back, and I want them to really steal the show at that point, transition from spring bloomers into very late or early summer bloomers, and that way they can be showcased and they can be in the spotlight as the Deutzia fades. But it definitely is one of my favorite, favorite spring bloomers. Something else that it does, because it kind of grows in this cascading, undulating fashion, that what I have noticed, and let me see, I don't know if I've got any examples of it, but what will happen is, is that some of these long branches will bend over and you can easily secure them to the ground or it might do it, Mother Nature might do it, and it happens naturally, and it will take root and form a whole nother plant. Let me see if this has done it here. This, is, this here is starting to do it. This one is starting to do it. So you can make another plant just by securing it at a leaf node to the ground. And often it will do that and that can make it spread, but not in an overly aggressive way. You'll notice that I've still left a lot of the leafy mulch on it to kind of protect it if we have a cold spell. But this blooms reliably whether we have a late freeze or not. Now last year it suffered a tiny bit from those minus 13 degree temperatures, but that was really an outlier for us. And for the most part, in the 20 years that I've grown it, it has performed absolutely beautiful, and it looks wonderful when it's entirely surrounded by white. Oh, by the way, I sometimes will also have big pots of white dianthus and other things around it. It makes a wonderful backdrop for wedding shoots, for bridal, um, bridal showers, things of that nature, and many a time a bride has been photographed in front of this when it was in bloom because it just kind of screams wedding. So that would be my first of my three favorite blooming, spring blooming shrubs, Dutzia or Deutzia. And I, Stuart, let's remember to put some pictures of one. It looks absolutely glorious. Now let's move on to number two. Well, here's my number two plant and it's another instance where I moved it from one location to another. So this one I have moved, I think, well, this was just its second move. It used to be in the border across from the Potager. I had no idea how long it was or how large it was going to get. And this is a Wygela. It is a really exceptionally gorgeous performer, I think, not just in spring, but it will even intermittently put out flowers in the summer and into the fall. The foliage on this variety is a golden color, kind of a chartreuse, depending on how much sun it's getting, but it really illuminates this part of the garden. And then it puts out these wonderful tubular flowers that are kind of a deep rose or a fuchsia color. It is a great pollinator attractor. I think it also really attracts hummingbirds, though I don't know that it's published to do that. 
it's something that can look a little bit straggly, I think, and it really wants room to kind of romp and roam. I don't have a large garden, so I have to basically kind of tame it, and I do that by pruning it up from the base, from the base, and like so many other things I work with, I transform it from a large shrub into a small tree, and I've done that over the years. And it's also got lots of like errant sucker type branching like this one that I will clip out so it has a more tight architectural shape, I guess, and where more of the trunks can be shown. I hope you guys, Stuart, I don't know how loud that is in your earbuds, but okay, but there's definitely some kind of equipment going on behind me. Um, but it really, it also has these undulating arching branches. It has this rather uh, umbrella form. I prune this after bloom. It too can be propagated by just bending over a branch, securing it to the ground at a leaf node point and allowing it to send out roots and shoots in that area. Now, Southern Living Plant Collection has some beautiful varieties that I want to try and Stuart, we're gonna post those here with a link. And I, I just, I, I particularly I particularly like the golden leaved ones, but I also love the green and white variegated ones with a pink that's a little bit more pale. And I think those are beautiful too. Now, why do I like it? Well, it's not fussy about soil. It's not fussy about lots of fertilizing. It will complain in times of drought and limited rainfall, and it will also complain and the leaves will turn crispy in a very, very hot summer. But other than that, I think it just does beautifully. Uh, one other thing that I, I want to point out that I didn't on the Dutzia, the Dutzia, it really kind of can handle wet conditions. So it's by an area where water tends to collect. And if you've got an area like that in your garden, then it might be a spot that will make a good, where Dutzia would be a good candidate for that spot. This area is an area where it's really neither too wet nor too dry, but the, the soil is naturally clay-like. Obviously, any shrub, any plant in general, really will benefit from good soil and wonderful drainage. And I try to provide that for any plant, shrub, perennial, annual, that I plant new. But over time, my ground's natural, my Oklahoma dirt's natural default setting is heavy clay. And over time, it will consume all of that organic matter. But hopefully by that time, it's gotten established and it will perform beautifully. The other reason that I like it is the color of those flowers not only attract pollinators, butterflies, etc., but they also really blend in with other colors of things that I've got blooming simultaneously in the garden. Some of my wonderful dragon wing and angel wing begonias, um, some of my geraniums, things of that nature. So I like the fact that it coordinates in color and bloom time with those other spectacular specimens in the garden. So that would be my number two. It's an old fashioned plant of which there are many new cultivars. It is really bullet proof and I highly recommend it. Well, Stuart, I think you will verify that this is probably the most asked about plant in my garden. And for those of you that have followed me for a long time, you probably are tired of hearing me talk about it, but it doesn't, it, it almost seems to me as if I cannot talk about it enough. This is just a common Chinese snowball viburnum. Now, in general, as a category, I think viburnums are so underused in the landscape, and there are so many different kinds. Now, this one is the more old-fashioned, just common variety, often mistaken for a hydrangea because it's blooms that start out kind of a limey green and eventually turn just a pristine white they very much have that hydrangea bloom form. Now, you know, you know that contest, Stuart, where you guess how many pennies are in a jar, or how many jelly beans are in a jar? 
I, we should do some kind of contest where we guess just how many blooms are on this shrub this season. I, I, I don't know that I could even guesstimate. I guess I would have to do a sample branch, count them, and then kind of extrapolate from there. This year, it may be the best year ever if we don't get a really terrible apocalyptic weather event, because sometimes what I find is that it will put out blooms on one side, but not the other. But this year, it is uniformly profuse with those gorgeous buds all across the canopy. Now, I have said ad nauseum, you guys, this started out as an $11 shrub from Lowe's, and it did so well that over time, two things. Number one, it really has outgrown its spot, but I am certainly not going to relocate it right now because it's simply spectacular, not just as a bloomer in the spring, but it's just an exceptionally beautiful structural plant all year long. Um, but this started out just as, a, as an $11 shrub that I pruned up over time and I continue to do that. And what I mean is I remove all the lower branching. So down at the base, Stuart, you can probably see some suckers that are starting to come out. And over time, I remove those to just expose the large trunks. And that does several things. It allows more light below the canopy of the shrub. It makes it seem artificially larger and gives it more presence than there is. It enhances the beauty of the texture and the, oh, the, I think just really attractive qualities of the trunks themselves. But it allows me then an underplanting zone. It's very sturdy, so I can hang some hanging baskets off of it in the summertime and in the spring to inject some color when it goes kind of a bluish gray, but it's absolutely superb. I, you know what I need to do, Stuart? I need to take my own advice and I need to clip some of these branches and bring them into force because they, they are just beautiful. I would bet they, so would you say that the size of the blooms bigger than a grapefruit typically? softball grapefruit size it, it just depends sometimes even larger than that now I think one thing that has really helped is that when I planted it it has a dedicated I don't think you can see it here I'm having irrigation work done but it has a dedicated drip head at the base so it gets wonderful consistent moisture without being over watered now there are so many different kinds of viburnum you guys this is the Chinese snowball viburnum I have one that is a Japanese more like a snowflake viburnum I equate it to those that you sometimes see in so many floral arrangements the heads are much smaller and the leaves are more delicate and not so thick but there are oh so many different varieties I have some viburnum all that glitters and all that glows whose flowers are really rather um, they're just not such a much but the foliage is very glossy really beautiful it can illuminate a dark space and it puts out wonderful blueberries and that's another thing to commend the viburnums in the fall that viburnum blue of the berries is just stunning um, there are some that are more low growing and compact that almost could be a substitute for boxwood I think um, there are some that are get exceptionally large and have really thick leathery leaves and a flower form that is that maybe more closely resembles an Indian hawthorn they're not one of my favorites um, but I love this in addition to the flowers I love it for its silvery gray foliage and for for the fact that it is pretty much indestructible um, look for them. They can sometimes be hard to find because I think they're just, they're one of those common heirloom plants that you can't find any, everywhere. But this is definitely, if I ever start a new garden, this would definitely be one of the showcased plants that I, that I would bring. It is, it is just simply phenomenal. But again, as a broad category, don't overlook viburnums in your landscape. And some of them turn, the foliage turns an absolutely beautiful color in the fall. 
Now, some of you may be saying, well, what about other things like um, azaleas, because I love azaleas and encore azaleas in particular. What about flowering quince and forsythia and flowering almond and spireas? And I love all of those and I have grown pretty much all of those. Um, but with the exception of, of the azaleas, the other ones just haven't performed as well for me, probably because there's not good garden fit. And in my book, I talk a lot about what is good garden fit. And for example, a forsythia would just be way too constrained in my small urban garden. It really needs to be, I love the way it looks when it's planted next to a pond or some kind of, of water surface where it can kind of, there's a reflection against its yellow blooms, bright yellow blooms, but it has large arching canes. It really needs lots of room to grow. Quince also, I think, to really be spectacular, even though there's some hybridized versions, I think it can be a little bit rough in a more ornamental um, and clipped and small garden like mine. Um, I do one plant I wish I could grow, but again, I just don't know that I've got room for it right now, is mock orange. So I would definitely in my next garden hope to include some mock orange. And of course, I, I love azaleas and I love encore azaleas, um, but I don't think of encore azaleas, I guess, anymore. Even though they bloom in the spring, I don't think of them as just a spring bloomer because they rebloom and they bloom in the fall and sometimes in the summer. So I don't think of them as much as a spring bloomer. So there's many more but for me, these are absolutely my favorites. Please, as my late question of the day, make sure to put your zone and let me know what your favorite split spring bloomers are and what their situation is, how you have optimized and, and really synergized their beauty in your landscape. So there you go, there are my three favorite spring blooming shrubs that you might want to consider for your own garden. Well, here you go. Here is your outfit of the day. My earrings are just those simple, basic kind of chunky loops that I like so much. I got these from one of my favorite boutiques here in Oklahoma City. My scarf came from TJ Maxx years ago. It is one of my winter faves. My sweater came from I either H&M or World Market. I believe H&M. Uh, my britches came from Goodwill. They are Ann Taylor Loft. They're one of my favorite favorite pair uh, via Goodwill, by the way, and my boots came from Amazon, my chunky boots, and as did my gloves, which I bought online. Stuart, have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. Okay, there you go. There is your outfit du jour.